Okay, hi everyone, I am John Simmons. I'm uh, Executive Director of the Alliance for Open Media. And uh, this is an organization that develops uh, standards for open royalty free uh, technology uh, using uh, open source techniques for developing those, um, those standards. And it's, it is, as Jim said, it's part of the Joint Development Foundation, which is part of the Linux Foundation uh, ecosystem. Uh, and um, uh, some of uh, you with a video background, I don't know if, how many people here, the show of hands, have heard of AV1 or, or Dash or Common Encryption, any of those things. I see one hand. Okay, so um, basically AV1 was the first standard developed by the Alliance for Open Media. It's a royalty-free uh, video codec, and it's used by, by YouTube and Netflix, and it's used by a lot of other uh, industry participants, uh, Facebook and so forth. So uh, in this brief keynote, and I actually think we ought to coin the phrase key post-it note for these little short little uh, keynotes, uh, I want to go into some thoughts about this, uh, about open web standards and its impact on uh, uh, open source development. So. Um, uh, the broadcast in industry, the television industry, is going through what could be called a strategic inflection point. Uh, we're witnessing a rapid sea change transformation of that industry. And uh, this is a sh shift from broadcast to broadband. Uh, it's a shift to a more open, flexible, user-centric mode of delivery of video. And we're all experiencing this today on our mobile phones. Uh, devices connected to our TV sets, using other applications to get content. But it's very difficult to see this, uh, the, how wide-ranging and ubiquitous this is, because these kinds of changes tend to disrupt a whole segment of the industry, and that's what's happening today. And a lot of it has a profound impact on the open source community. Um, uh, some of the changes are pretty obvious. You know, it's opening up new opportunities for media companies, new media sources to play in the ecosystem instead of just having your cable provider or your satellite provider. But some of them are less obvious because they, uh, it, it allows, for example, more ways to monetize all of the serious research and development that goes into producing things like Codex. So uh, I want to briefly outline some of those significant changes as they affect the open source community. But I find it uh, uh, instructive to peer back at, to a major uh, revolutionary change that happened in, already in the 90s, and that's the creation of the World Wide Web, because I think there's some pretty significant parallels there. Uh, this is a diagram showing the growth of the World Wide Web. I don't know how many people realize this, but it, the web was created so that particle physicists could share graphical user data, uh, uh, scientific data, between labs around the world. Uh, and at the beginning, the first website, there was only one website at CERN, at their headquarters in uh, Geneva. And uh, in, by 92, there were 26 websites. And those were principally labs around uh, the globe that were doing physics. Uh, but then by 1997, there were over a million websites. So what happened? What, what triggered that expansive growth, that kind of an inflection point, if you will? And what happened was the appearance of Mosaic uh, and the Netscape browsers uh, in 93, 94. Once you have a client that's ubiquitous and interoperable, and that client uh, can work with multiple services, then you see more services, you see more clients, and you get sort of a, a, uh, a exponential growth type of situation. And But the important thing is, is that when it went from the walled garden era that we're looking at here to the post-walled garden era, which is more the, you know, the Google era, the, brow uh, the search engine era, we went from an era like with America Online, with curated content uh, that to a more open, user-centric consumption of internet content, which is very much the, the world that the open source community lives in. And this transition is precisely the transition that the broadcast television industry is going through in the next 
10 years. And it's a very dramatic impact. So um, uh, the World Wide Web was a strategic inflection point, similar to what we're seeing with the broadcast world. Um, and it's had a profound impact on the industry. But you know, to understand how that works, you have to look back to what someone like Andy Grove, who's the former CEO of Intel, said when he, in his book, Only the Paranoid Survive. He was basically pointing out that when there's an inflection point like this, if you continue doing your business, if you're some, something fundamental to your business changes, something usually that the executives who are doing the business management or figuring out how to monetize their business are completely unaware of. That's, that's what happened to the internet when TCP IP became public domain, when AT&T put it in the public domain. There were lots of businesses that existed selling software to network computers together in your office. And they were toast, but they didn't know it because TCP IP was gonna be in all the Macs and PCs, and now there's no need for special third-party software for networking computers. The same thing happened in the World Wide Web. And so when you see that kind of curve going up, that's because when these inflection points occur, the horizon becomes very close. It's very difficult to see what's gonna happen. You have to go into startup mode, and if you double down on the way you're doing business today, then there's a tendency to basically go down that decline. And that's what we're seeing right now in a very big way across the entire uh, commercial media industry. And, it's, and they're really quite concerned about it. Um, but it's understandable because most innovations are merely incremental improvements. You see some, some change and you say, well, it's an inc incremental improvement. It doesn't change fundamentally how things work. But if it's uh, an innovation that's sufficiently uh, um, in, uh, it, revolutionary, then you'll have a revolutionary change. And revolutionary changes, if you look back at the World Wide Web, there was a point in time where there wasn't the web, and then suddenly it was everywhere. And when a revolutionary change occurs, it doesn't announce itself. It's just, it's, it's, you rarely see it approaching, and then suddenly everything changes, and then it's hard to imagine a world without it. Uh, a great example, 1871, Alexander Graham Bell was trying to create a harmonic telegraph. You used to have to send, a telegraph could not transmit a message, but one at a time. He was trying to find a way to convey multiple messages simultaneously over the same wire, and an accident enabled him to realize that this could be used to convey the human voice. So that was a complete accident, and of course it revolutionized uh, communication. And the same thing happened in 1877 with Thomas Edison was trying to, for, again with the telegraph, he wanted to record telegraph messages on little indentations on paper tape so they could be played back repeatedly and, and, and flawlessly. But then he realized that same technique could be used to record the human voice. So these kinds of innovations that seem to come out of nowhere at the time that they happen, no one is envisioning, like with the recording of human voice, the entire radio industry, you know, or, or, or movie, uh, excuse me, of uh, photograph records, you know, the whole, all the things that come out of that kind of transition. And quite honestly, that's what's happening right now with the consumer um, industry. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what the fundamental changes are that are happening and how they relate to the open source community. Um, this, is, uh, this is a list that I put together about these changes. What's the difference between traditional and web media? Closed ecosystems versus open ecosystems. You, you have a uh, uh, traditional model is that you have a, it's not really a platform. It's a device that someone puts in your home so you can consume their content. Whereas what's happening with media uh, devices in the future is they are a genuine platform that is created as more of an open source implementation. And even if that open source implementation is a device that is owned by, say, one company, they still have to listen to all of the different applications that would run, media applications that would run on that device to make sure that they're capable of providing the right kind of platform. And that means they have to be open to innovation and to, um, and to the kind of activity that open source development uh, is built for. Um, 
there are some other significant changes, regional versus global, and that lends itself, you know, because all the standards for media consumption today tend to be regional. But as you go to a global model, that lends itself towards open source development. And also, uh, device component requirements. This is actually very interesting. When you put a, uh, a, uh, a uh, on a, when a service um, decides that they could use, or a standard for a service says, I could use this codec or that codec, whatever's optional for the service is mandatory for a device, which creates a, a fight over which codecs are gonna be required inside of devices. But in the web media world, th thanks to the work that we've done in HTML5, there, there are uh, open methods for media capability reporting where you can go down and ask a device, do you support this codec, do you support that one, what profile, so you can tailor the content to match that device. And that has a, a profound impact on the way uh, uh, the, the device manufacturer has to support different kinds of video and, and how that moves forward. So um, kind of zipping along here because there's lots, if you want to reach out to me, I'm happy to talk about these things because it's all I do pretty much every day. Device interaction being defined, it's like in a closed ecosystem. They say, this is my device from my cable provider or satellite provider, and there isn't a lot of opportunity for innovation, but in fact, with mobile computing and with um, the uh, advent of device interaction being incorporated directly into media playback devices, there's a big opportunity there as well. Um, and I think this is one of the most interesting ones. The value chain is narrow at the top. Basically, if a cable provider provides you a device for consuming content, they're the only ones that are monetizing it. Uh, and you, in fact, can only monetize your content through them. Whereas uh, uh, devices that use for media consumption today could be from anyone, and they can support thousands of different applications. And this has a profound impact on how you monetize things like codecs because rather than, this is why, world, uh, why the World Wide Web tends to be royalty free, is because there's an, uh, a broad, wide open opportunity at the top for providing services on that device. Um, and, uh, and that's one of the reasons why uh, the Alliance for Open Media distributes a royalty free codec. Uh, and of course there's this issue of content discovery which is still not solved. It's an unsolved problem today on how you want to watch a movie when you have multiple sources for that movie. And this is the kind of thing that the open source community can help solve. Um, so I, I want to just kind of, in closing, just kind of make the comment that I think this transition that is happening right now, it's roughly between now and 2030, is an enormous opportunity for the open source community. If it's allowed to proceed at pace, which it seems to be doing, it will give rise to a more open, flexible, user-centric form of media delivery. It'll provide increased choice for consumers, accelerate innovation, and foster competition, uh, and create an enormous opportunity for the open source community. So thank you very much.